Hey everyone, Tankenstein here, and welcome to your War Thunder Tank Iceberg Explained. In this video, I have generated an iceberg from the tip of the iceberg all the way down to the bottom with various tanks, ideas, tactics, things of that nature that go from, of course, at the tip of the iceberg being the most known to all the way down at the very bottom being the least known things relating to tanks and ground vehicles in War Thunder. Now, with that being said, I have created an aviation version of this that I will try to link below and if there are any valid links like let's say if i say if there's a review or anything like that i will also try to link it in the comments below but that being said let's get into it now let's start all the way here at the tip of the iceberg so to start we have of course the most well-known vehicles and likely the most played vehicles in all of war thunder so of course we have the shermans plenty of different variants of the shermans including the standard m4 the m4a1 a2 a3 you have the jumbos you have the fireflies you have the 76 for the americans the italian versions you have the super shermans there are probably dozens and dozens of shermans in game and it is possibly the most played vehicle in all of war thunder at least once considering all variants next up we have the t-34s this is pretty much going to be about the russian equivalent of the sherman there are tons of variants of this so you have the t-34 prototype the t-34 1940 41 you have the 57 millimeter equipped the 85 millimeter equipped you have the 85 millimeter equipped with the dt-5 if i'm not mistaken you have the 100 millimeter equipped there are tons of variants of t-34s again one of the most popular popular and well-known vehicles in all of War Thunder. Next up, we have Tiger Tanks. Who doesn't like Tiger Tanks? Tiger Tanks are very, very often played, but there are far fewer variants of this. You have the Panzer Befelsvaken 6P, the VK 4501P, you have the Tiger 2H, you have the Tiger E, as well as the Tiger Camouflage Tiger, if that makes any sense, as well as the Heavy Tank number 6. There are a few variants of the Tiger, but far fewer than the Sherman and the T-34. However, this is a legendary vehicle, and of course deserves to be right there at the very tip of the iceberg, or really more so beyond the tip of the iceberg, up in the air. Next up, we have Panthers, much the same thing. These have really wide claim in war thunder you have the panther d a g and f as well as the panther 2 you have the dolphin you have the t5 there are numerous panthers in war thunder you have the m10 ersatz however i will be going over that a little bit more but of course there are plenty of panthers again one of the most well-known and most played tanks in all of war thunder as well as the new vk tank that is essentially a predecessor to the panther next we have centurions again another very very heavily played tank this is more of a medium to high br tank starting off around 6.3 with the Mark 1, ending up somewhere around 8.0, a little bit above 8.0 with whatever variants the Israeli tech tree uses, as well as some other specialized variants that tend to be premiums, but again, a very, very common tank. Next, we have reserve tanks. These are tanks that pretty much everyone has access to at all times. These are the first tanks that you will see in any tech tree, and are things like the M2A4 for the American tech tree, the T26 for the Russian tech tree, the H39 for the French. You guys get the idea. Reserve tanks are often oftentimes the first experience that people have in War Thunder ground forces. However, they are not really the most played vehicles because really it just takes only a few matches to get from reserve to the first tanks in game that you can actually purchase. Even if you have very little experience playing tanks, it's still pretty damn easy to get your first unlockable tank or two. Next, we have the Leopards. This is another German type of tank. Germans love their tanks and they are arguably the best at making tanks in the world. So Leopards are one of the most common tanks. They're kind of around the same BR that you can see Centurions, but just for the sake of this video, I'll be including all Leopards from the Leopard 1 all the way up to the Leopard 2A6, and whatever future variants of the Leopards that we have. Very, very common vehicles. I mean, you have the, the Stridgewagen 122 PLSS, the A, B, whatever, uh, for the Swedish tech tree as well. Probably going to be getting the Spanish Leopard 2 as well, so a lot of variants in War Thunder, and likely still a lot to come. And then finally, we have the High BR Premiums. These are things like the T-72 AV Terms, XM1 GM, the XM1 Chrysler, Challenger DS, the VRCC, you guys get the idea. These are vehicles that people will oftentimes purchase in order to grind through the entirety of the tech tree, which brings up another point and something I was going to include in probably the next tier, but I'll just say it here. You have a bunch of one death levers, which is stemming from the high prevalence of people purchasing high BR premium tanks and not having any idea how to use them, nor buying backups. So it's a pretty big problem at top tier, but again, other portions of this 
Iceberg will address that. With that said, we are already in stage two, so this is pretty much kind of the tip of the iceberg, where the iceberg more or less meets the water. So let's just start off with ERA and composite armor, but really you could also mention world homogenous armor and whatever other types of armor in game, uh, aluminum armor, things of that nature. So essentially ERA is explosive reactive armor as well as composite armor, which is just composite armor. It's got many different types of material kind of pancaked into a certain uh, shape or whatever in the tank hole or the turret. And these are supposed to protect a little bit better against things like heat FS and APF SDS, as well as of course, classic types of ammunition like APHE, APCBC, so on and so forth. Speaking of all those types of ammunition, we have shell types next, and this will be a run for my money here, but I'll try to list off as many as I can in as short of time as possible. So we have APCBC, AP, APHE, APCR, which is terrible for the most part, APDS, APF, SDS, HEAT, HEAT FS, HE, HESH, ATGMs, tandem charge ATGMs, and really just, there might be a few other ones that I'm missing here, but those are more or less the main types in War Thunder. Next on the list, we have nukes, and this is something that you might be surprised to hear, but I have yet to actually achieve a nuke. So you have tons of people out there who've gotten nukes, more or less, you have to get 2,500 points in ground RB in order to get a nuke, so long as your BR is applicable for nukes. I believe they start at around 6.0 or 6.3 BR, and you can kind of get nukes from there, and something like 20 kills in a row in AB, so it's not an easy achievement at all. I myself have gotten very close numerous times, like around 2,300, 2,400 points. Of course, what happens is the match ends and that's it. But pretty much, if you get the nuke, you spawn into a plane with a nuke, you have to then fly that plane all the way to the battlefield, so it's not a guaranteed thing that you can actually do that. A lot of times enemies will shoot you down, whether by SPAA or enemy fighters, and then once you get there, you drop the nuke, wait a few seconds, and the entire entire map erupts in the flames of an angry sun and you win the match. Now with that said, we have squadron tanks next. Squadron tanks are essentially just tanks that you can earn by being in a squadron. So you have things like the T-80UK, which is a direct but small upgrade over the T-80U. You then have the T-80U for the Swedish ground tech tree, which is a downgrade from the Russian T-80U. There's the Leopard 2PL, the M1A1 AIM, the Object 122 for this Chinese ground tech tree. Squadron vehicles are more or less a fast track to be able to get into higher tier matches for ground vehicles, but of course they're not premium vehicles, nor do they provide premium bonuses, so always be wary when purchasing these because they are not good for grinding the tech tree. Next we have camping, it kind of speaks for itself, but this is more or less when somebody sits in a specific area for a long period of time and more or less just kind of shoots anyone that goes past. Some people would consider it to be cheap, some people would consider it to be a valid strategy, I'll let you guys decide that for yourselves. Next we have artillery, and this is something that you can call if you are in pretty much any tank outside of heavy tanks and I believe tank destroyers. More or less what this does is it allows you to call down an artillery strike on a specific area of the map, occasionally getting a kill or an assist in the process. Beyond this we have bushes and this kind of goes with camping. Bushes are one of the more controversial mechanics in War Thunder in that you can purchase a set of bushes, up to six of them you can put on your tank actually, each for around 200 GE. This will make it so that your tank can be covered in foliage essentially and make it very very difficult to see especially if you're not moving which would then aid camping next we have wallet warriors and this pretty much goes with the high br premium thing that i mentioned earlier pretty much wallet warriors are people that purchase high br premiums or just a bunch of premiums and that's what they use to fill out their lineups they do not get anything in the regular tech tree or if they do they just kind of buy their way through the regular tech tree as much as they can essentially their entire game is built on purchasing vehicles with as much real money as possible beyond this we have captured tanks and this one's very interesting because these are mostly premium tanks but you have things like Dauphine, the T5, you have the German KV-1 with the 75mm cannon for Germany which is excellent even though it was nerfed because its BR was increased recently but you also have the German T-34 which was also nerfed because it had its BR increased recently but again I mean those are just some examples of captured tanks that you can use in War Thunder. Next up, we have Battle Pass tanks, things like the Centurion Mark V-1, the T-10A, the Toldy II, the Tehran, the Churchill Crocodile, the T-55E1, which is pretty much a plant cart, and you'll typically see one or two of these coming out with every single Battle Pass, sometimes for free as well, so it's pretty damn worth it. But in recent Battle Passes, Gaijin has gone away from having free tanks and just giving people some premium time instead. With that said, we are getting further into the iceberg here, 
here and now we are underwater. So first and foremost, and this is something a lot of people will know about, but is not immediately known to a lot of newer players, forbidden German tanks. That's right, there are several German tanks in War Thunder that are more or less forbidden, sometimes coming out of the shadows during events like the anniversary events, you have the mouse, but in general these forbidden German tanks are the mouse, the Tiger II 10.5, the Panther II, and the Flak Panzer 341 Coelian. And these are vehicles that were removed probably around three years ago as of the making of this video because they were not technically real tanks, and because they were not technically real tanks and Gaijin was just starting to get really serious about what types of vehicles they allowed in War Thunder, they have to be pretty much real, they decided to take away these vehicles, although the people who have them got to keep them, so there's that. Now when it comes to the mouse, of course the mouse is a real tank, it was built, but per Gaijin it was just too tough to balance so they decided to take it out of the game, although again it is given as an anniversary reward at this point pretty much every single year. Next we have the PE. And the PE-8 is something that pretty much every mid-BR ground vehicle player knows in that the PE-8 drops essentially a mini nuke with its 5,000 kilogram bomb, which will oftentimes get 3, 4, 5, 6 plus kills whenever it's dropped. So this thing is devastating to enemy ground forces. Next up, we have Dozer Blades, and these are modifications to ground vehicles typically of higher BR, give or take around 8.0 BR+, plus. although the Centurion AVR-E also has one of these, but essentially Essentially, dozer blades are modifications that you can use to dig a hole and decide to entrench yourself into the ground. Sometimes it can be good, but for the most part, these are useless and are essentially just things that will cost you more money to repair if your vehicle gets destroyed. Next up, we have volumetric armor and shells. And yes, I know I misspelt it as Amor, so it's not volumetric love, but hey, if you guys want to say that, that's what it is. So volumetric armor and shells, those were both introduced a few years ago. Essentially, when it comes to volumetric shells at least back a few years ago i mean just somewhat recently in war thunder's history every single shell all the way down from 20 millimeter auto cannons up through 150 millimeter plus shells were all rendered essentially as 50 cal projectiles so they would be that size technically so once they hit a vehicle they could slip into things that 50 cals could go into and so you would have these gigantic shells again 150 millimeters 100 plus millimeters even just slipping right into turret rings and annihilating tanks like that and once volumetric shells were introduced it kind of made it so that armor would take a totally new role in war thunder and it's revolutionized how armor interacts with shells in war thunder and a lot of people don't like it but for the most part i think it's been good the other part of that is volumetric armor and this has to be implemented on a tank by tank basis and in fact actually if i'm not mistaken they're still implementing volumetric armor into various tanks for example tiger 2's just recently saw volumetric armor even though this is have been going on for years now and essentially volumetric armor works on the same principle as volumetric shells in that it just more accurately models how the armor is supposed to have been in real life by giving it actual volume rather than just saying oh well this is 50 millimeters of armor and that's it so it, it kind of more accurately models that or at least tries to do so even though volumetric armor has had its fair share of issues in the past speaking of issues we have ghost shells and ghost shells became a huge problem around the time coincidentally or not that volumetric armor and shells were introduced into the game and essentially ghost shells if you guys have ever dealt with them are when you fire a shell at an enemy and even though you clearly see it hit the enemy it just doesn't do anything there's no result and then that enemy knows that you're there and they fire at you and they kill you it's the most annoying thing in war thunder possibly more than high pl next we have three kind of similar topics so first russian bias russian bias is essentially the idea that war thunder the devs of war thunder gaijin are very much partial towards Russian vehicles and as a result give them buffs or give them favorable BR placement like with the T-72 AV terms or more recently the 2S-38 or the BMP-2M where they can essentially dominate their BR bracket even though they are much more powerful than most other vehicles around again that BR bracket. Next we have Germany suffers and again somewhat related to the idea of Russian bias except flipped on its head and put to Germany. This is the idea that German vehicles are unnecessarily punished in game through BR increases or maybe their specs aren't quite right they underperform relative to what they had done in real life I'm not really sure if this is accurate or if this is as a result of my next thing on this list which is terrible German teams it has been pretty well known that win rates for Germany have been pretty bad for quite a while 
I personally love German vehicles. I have very high success with them, but I'm also a very experienced player. And the thing is that War Thunder keeps releasing vehicles for Germany, so high BR premium vehicles and things of that nature. It's one of the most highly played nations in War Thunder, and as a result, it gets probably about the most attention for any nation. And as a result for that, again, you have a lot of high BR premium tanks, event vehicles, things of that nature, where a bunch of noobs will play them. They do terribly, like with the Leopard 2 PL and you start seeing either BR changes, spec changes, whatever the case may be, and uh, it's really, really bad. But essentially, you have, again, these very powerful vehicles like the Tiger, the Panther, some Leopards in there, and the German teams just cannot string it together for a victory, despite having, on paper, very powerful vehicles that, again, I know that I personally do very well with, so I don't really know why anyone else doesn't do very well with them, but maybe I just like that certain type of playstyle, and other people like the idea of that sort of play style, but they just don't really do well with it. Who knows? Next up, we have BR Compression. This kind of links to what I just said as well. BR Compression is essentially the idea that you have a vehicle such as the German M48A2C or the 2S38 or really any vehicle that kind of feels weird at its BR. And as a result, you have a very out of place vehicle that either underperforms or overperforms. And it makes it very weird because some of these vehicles have just ridiculously powerful technology or shells or armor for that BR. And because BR compression is such a thing where more or less you have a bunch of new vehicles that keep getting added to War Thunder and they make it so that, you know, where do you put, for example, the T-55, 1949, the 47, the 51. And it makes it kind of weird because other vehicles that have been in game for three or four years up to that point, now they have to face those new vehicles and it creates a whole jumble. And more or less the idea is, is that by decompressing BRs, it makes it so that vehicles that probably should be facing each other are more likely to face each other, but of course Gaijin doesn't do this because they feel, or at least they say that they feel, that match queues will be quite a bit longer than they are currently, so of course they are resistant to the idea of BR decompression, but who knows what this will bring in the future. Next we have overpressure, and this is more or less the idea, and this was introduced slightly after, if I'm not mistaken, volumetric shells and armor were introduced, but it was pretty much an idea that HE shells have a higher amount of pressure, as well as bombs and really anything with a high amount of explosive filler in them, where if you hit a tank or hit near a tank with a high enough amount of explosive filler, it would create a shock wave that would then overpressure and kill the crew. So this is actually a cornerstone of gameplay when it comes to vehicles like the Broom Bar, the KV-2, nowadays the Storm Tiga, but again, this is more or less just kind of a metric, a way to make bombs and HE shells more useful, at least if they're large enough. Beyond this, we have White Rock Fortress and other removed maps. So in War Thunder's history, numerous maps have been removed from circulation and a lot of the time you don't even notice them until it's been like six months later and you realize you're like man I haven't played that map in like six months. And so White Rock Fortress being a more recent example of that, I believe Red Desert being another example, you just do not see these in map rotations anymore, and it's because they've been removed or they're being reworked. A lot of the time, Gaijin will bring them back to the game, but with some serious reworks after, again, a few months or years. And then finally for this tier, we have Ground Assault Arcade. Ground Assault Arcade is a way for people to play if they don't feel like playing against other players, where you can essentially defend an area from a bunch of bots. It's a lot of fun, but it's not very often played. And it takes quite a while for the most part to actually get a queue for this. But again, you can get boosters with this. I believe you can get universal backups. So it's actually pretty darn useful to do at least once a day or once every few days and helps out tremendously with the grind. Now, with all that said, let's get into the next tier. And we are kind of in the middle of the bottom of the iceberg here. First off, we have top tier is unplayable. Now, this is something that's kind of come up in recent months, recent years, where a lot of people have just become dissatisfied with how top tier is between CAS, between sniping, base camping, various things that just make it very difficult to even want to continue playing. But essentially, you'll have it where you spawn in and a drone just knocks you out or you spawn in and there's a helicopter that's like five kilometers away with an ATGM already on its way or spawn campers who will just sit outside your base behind a hill and they're almost impossible to shoot, but they peek out every now and again and they just kill your team. Then you have a bunch of one death leavers who leave and it's just a whole cascading 
fascinating thing where a lot of the time, unlike in low and mid VR matches, where you have a lot of people staying until the end of the match, in top tier, if your team is being dominated, especially when it comes to higher repair costs, which are prevalent in high VR matches, you will have a lot of people leaving and then your team will be left with like two or three people, especially if the enemy team really participates in uh, what a lot of people would consider to be cheap behavior. Next, we have rare marketplace slash event tanks. And some examples I've listed are the Ursatz M10, the Pac Puma, but you also have things like the IS-7 as well. Other vehicles like the T-72 M2 Moderna, as well as the Object 279. And even though those latter two examples are not incredibly rare at this point, they will of course become more expensive and more rare as time goes on. Things like the Ursatz and the Pac Puma, very, very rare to see in match. In fact, actually, I don't think I've seen the Ursatz M10 in a match in probably years. I'm pretty sure actually that the last time I saw one in match was when I last played it, probably about two years ago. Now we have Just Spawn into AA, and this is kind of a meme at this point, and it's something that you might only notice if you kind of troll the forums or things of that nature, but pretty much, especially in high BR matches, if your team is being crushed or if you don't really have many spawn points left in ground RB, what'll happen is people just kind of say, oh, well, just spawn to AA. No one wants to spawn to SPAA. It's at least not in my case. I really don't like it. It's not really fun. And by the time you spawn to SPAA, a lot of the time the enemy is surrounding your base and you'll just be picked off anyways. So it just feels almost pointless at that point. But of course, sometimes it can be useful and kind of fun, but it really depends on the type of SPAA that you have as well as the match setup that you still have left to fight. Next, we have rare pack vehicles such as the T-34 prototype, the M4748 Sherman, which is otherwise known as Herman the German Sherman, the Type 69 2A, things of that nature. So the T-34 prototype and Herman the German Sherman were recently introduced again into War Thunder and are periodically added into War Thunder during anniversary sales, but typically they're capped off at 2,000 sales and that's it. And even after the most recent sale of these vehicles, I've yet to see anybody in a match aside from myself using them. So these are very, very rare vehicles regardless of however many times Gotchen brings them back for sale. There are still very few people who actually bring them into match and again the other example I use and there are a few more than this but the Type 69 2A that is a vehicle that was actually a Chinese server exclusive and the Chinese server had actually gone off the face of the earth it, it ended and thus one of the reasons why you see more Chinese players in other servers nowadays but the Type 69 2A was actually brought to the worldwide client which is what most if not everybody uses nowadays it was brought over for about two or three days for sale as a premium pack vehicle and that was the only time anybody outside of China had the ability to purchase that vehicle and I purchased it because of course I'm a War Thunder content creator and it makes financial sense for me to purchase it but it is a very interesting thing this might be one of the rarest vehicles in War Thunder and I really don't know if people know it beyond this we have free Abrams and this is a part of War Thunder history that a lot of people remember but a lot of people don't really know about but essentially there was a content creator or more so it was a Gaijin representative so I believe it was one of their primary official streamers by the name of Sean, if I'm not mistaken, who was pretty upset in a stream one time and people kept asking for free parts, free fire equipment and tanks. And then he said, why don't we just give everybody a free Abrams? And I guess it upset a lot of people. And uh, essentially War Thunder came back and they actually made light of it by, if I'm not mistaken, creating a free decal for that, as well as possibly giving a free Abrams away at one point. I forget the exact details of it, but essentially it was a meme that was unintentionally created by an official War Thunder streamer who got really pissed off at people asking him for free things. Next, we have the E100, and this is possibly the ultimate of the rare, rare vehicles. So this, along with arguably the IS-7, are among the rarest and most expensive vehicles in War Thunder, and probably the E100 more so, where this is regularly sold on the marketplace for somewhere upwards of 2,000 GE, which is equivalent to around $2,000 USD. And essentially, the E100 is only awarded during tournaments and there have only been a handful of tournaments in war thunder's history that have rewarded it those ones typically only reward a few of them at a time maybe like one or two dozen I think in the past it's been a few hundred 
But considering how many people have dropped War Thunder since like five or six years ago when they had been doing this more often and giving away a few hundred, there are very few of these actually being played and the chances that you'll actually see one in a match are minuscule. I think there's only been about two or three times where I've seen these in a match in War Thunder in probably about the eight or nine years I've been playing this game. And it's so rare, in fact, that I cannot even get a test drive from Gaijin. They will literally rebuff me every single time I ask for it, regardless of how nice I am because of how rare this vehicle is. Next, we have fake tanks slash unknown tank specs. And this is kind of more of an issue with modern tanks because things like the M1A2 Sep Tusk, for example, the Leopard 2A6, a lot of those documents, a lot of these specifications are classified. And as such, War Thunder just kind of bases their vehicles in game on the best estimation that they can figure for these vehicles. And in many ways, it makes them very generic because, of course, if they think that a vehicle has has this much armor pen or this much armor, this much speed or X, Y, Z turret rotation speed, what will happen is they can more easily balance it out versus other vehicles. And thus they might say, oh, well, Germany gets the better shell and America gets the better armor. And, you know, whatever the case may be, Russia gets bias. And, you know, so they can kind of craft it on whatever they want and thus balance out the game based on however they feel like it should be balanced because they don't know the true specs of these vehicles. Which brings me to the next point, which is leaked classified documents and this has actually put war thunder in hot water and also in world news because people numerous times have leaked classified documents in war thunder forums in order to win an argument about war thunder or try to get a stat change in war thunder it's happened with the challenger 2 with a british tank crewman actually posting specs of the vehicle online in order to get the turret armor if i'm not mistaken or maybe it was the cannon breach armor fixed because he felt that it was not correct in War Thunder, and then there was a Leclerc crewman who posted stats, official stats, about the turret rotation speed of the Leclerc, although a lot of people felt like this was the least of the three that I'll be mentioning here, because of course, if you look at videos of the Leclerc, you can estimate what the turret rotation speed is from that. And then finally, there was a person who had leaked Chinese documentation, official documentation, about a new type of APF SDS round, which, of course, being that it's China, it got that person and probably into some hot water, but again, being that it's China, very secretive. I don't know what happened to that guy, but uh, I'm sure it's not good. And uh, yeah, just don't leak any sort of classified documentation. But again, this has gotten War Thunder into very public and very much worldwide news several times in the past. And hey, who knows? Maybe this will keep happening. Okay, so at this point, we only have two levels left and there isn't really all too much in these last few levels. So first off in this next level of the iceberg near the bottom, we have the D point. And this one really could have been put almost anywhere in this iceberg. Truthfully, I largely put it here because the other portions of this iceberg were pretty full and uh, it could still be put here. So the D point was essentially at one point a movable control point in certain game modes. So for example, you'd have the, if I'm not mistaken, A, B, and C points and the D point would kind of move around the map and you'd have to go to that point and then control it. I'm not really sure exactly why it's been removed from War Thunder, but the text prompt has not been removed and thus people keep saying attack the D point defend the D point and so on and so forth and it's become a meme at this point but of course the origin of the D point was in a real game mode at one time and also if I'm not mistaken in an April Fool's event where it brought it back temporarily. Next up we have removed French tanks and these were pretty much reserve vehicles from a few years ago when the French tech tree first became a thing at least when it came to ground forces and these were tanks like the FCM 36 the H 35 that were so bad that War Thunder removed them, except for people who of course already unlocked them, but they removed these vehicles from game because they were so terrible. For example, the FCM-36, which was pretty much a pyramid head tank, had only about 33 millimeters of armor pen at max from its APCR shell, as well as being very slow with terrible armor. So these were not good tanks at all and arguably are the worst tanks in War Thunder's history. Next up, we have the Twitch drop tanks, and this is a little bit more fun but more or less what these are are vehicles that were added to war thunder to celebrate twitch drops so every now and again if you watch war thunder twitch youtubers there will be drops on occasionally i even do it so if you guys want i will put my twitch account in the description below so if you want to follow it feel free but 
essentially every now and again there will be official drops from War Thunder where you can win things like the Panzer 3J1 TD if I'm not mistaken, a variant of the Panzer 2C TD, the TD being Twitch drop, and there was also one that Zoltan Sultan actually did a great video on for the Chiha Kai TD which is essentially one of the rarest vehicles in War Thunder because it was not advertised and they were on very specific Japanese streams. So being that War Thunder is not all that big in Japan, you pretty much just had to be coincidentally watching, for whatever reason, Japanese tournaments at that time in order to get these Twitch drops during that weekend that they were available. And of course, thus far, the Chiha Kai TD is one of the rarest vehicles in War Thunder because of it. Very, very weird. But again, Zoltan Sultan has a great video on that. Again, nearing the end here we have old war thunder roadmaps and this is something that i've actually done a video on in the past where i examined the old war thunder roadmaps and compared what they said would be coming to war thunder versus what actually came to war thunder and essentially these were roadmaps that were released somewhere around 2014 if i'm not mistaken or give or take around the time that originally ground vehicles were first released these would tell you what they felt like would be coming to war thunder so they had planned on for example the Stug thor the L and for example that finally came about six or seven years after they said it would be coming to war thunder and it came as a battle pass exclusive so again these are things that aren't even completely in war thunder yet and it's not as wild as aircraft were so back in the day back when war thunder first came out it was only aircraft and that was when war thunder was much more experimental with what they would put in game for example the ho229 if that was not in game when it first got released when aircraft were first in war thunder give or take around that time i doubt it would ever come to war thunder because nowadays things are so strict that they will not add a vehicle like that to games so it's very interesting to see how it was back then and even in the first few months or maybe the first year after tanks were first introduced into war thunder but again there are a lot of vehicles that were said to be coming into war thunder that just eventually never made it next up we have sim battles and sim battles are a little bit of a joke here but ultimately at least according to thunder skill they're played like five or ten percent as much as ground rb or even AB, so it's a very minimally played game mode, but it also requires a ton of skill. Trust me, guys, it is not easy. And then to cap this part of the iceberg off, we have ultra large decals. Basically, back in the day, you could more or less create your own custom skins in game by just making decals very, very big. So you could actually scale up decals to about the size of an entire tank back in the day. And since probably about four or five years ago, I think they've made it so that you can only make decals a certain size, but back. Back in the day, a lot of people were making it so that their tanks were completely covered in decals, making it so that it looked like they had a totally new paint job. Now, with all that said, we are right at the end of this iceberg. And as I just mentioned before, War Thunder became a lot less crazy around the time tanks were introduced. And as a result, there aren't really so many unknown crazy things that you could put at the bottom of this list. So it was a little bit sparse, but I did my best to at least fill it in with some things. So first off, we have PVE mode, and PVE mode is essentially something that's different than Ground Assault Arcade, where years ago, War Thunder had released a beta, essentially, where people could test out a convoy mode, where you'd have to defend a convoy going from town to town, essentially, and destroy the enemies on the way there. And it was very interesting. I liked it a lot, and it created a single-player or a semi-single player experience for War Thunder, basically a non-PVP experience, and we have heard nothing for years. Coincidentally, I was also going to place World War Mode in this iceberg, but we just recently heard some news about World War Mode, so maybe we will be hearing something about PvE Mode as well. After this, we have Walker and Potato Tanks. Now, these are two different things that were introduced during the same exact April Fool's event. Essentially, uh, you could get into a Walker and destroy other Walkers, and I believe other tanks as well, or Potato tanks where you could fire carrots or potatoes at other vehicles and destroy them. Essentially, the potato tanks were just these large inflatable uh, M4 Shermans that you could just go around and fire at, and they were powered by people on bicycles. So it was a very, very cool sort of April Fool's event. I hope most people did not forget it, but again, it was probably like six, seven years ago, so most of the people who participated in it probably just don't even play War Thunder anymore. Next up, we have Friendly Fire On. Back in the day, Friendly Fire was something that you 
actually had to worry about in War Thunder, and it got turned off essentially because people were just killing each other for no reason, or worse yet, they were targeting other people who they thought were maybe politically different, or maybe their countries were at odds in real life, so people were literally just killing each other en masse at the beginning of matches, just because they felt like the other person wasn't someone that they would like. So it was a pretty messy thing, and Friendly Fire, of course, is still on in aircraft battles, but it's not necessarily as big of an issue, but of course, it is still kind of a problem there, but again, not nearly as bad as it was a few years ago with tanks. And then finally, much like with my aircraft iceberg, we have Italy. Italy is at the very bottom of this iceberg because does this country even exist? I'm not even sure. No one plays their vehicles. The Ariate is just very much overlooked, and it is one of the rarest top-tier vehicles I've ever seen. I mean, whenever I see a person driving the PSO in match, I am blown away. Seriously, I just don't see it much more than once every probably dozen or two matches. It's a very, very rare vehicle, and very few people use Italy, unfortunately, even though their vehicles are pretty fun, especially up through the Centauro. So that said, please let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Again, check out my other iceberg video with aviation. I'm definitely interested to see what your thoughts are. But either way, thanks again, guys. Please consider subscribing if you like content like this, especially if you made it to this part of the video all the way at the end. But that said, thank you all so much, and I'll see you all on the other side. Take care, everyone.